Welcome to another episode of Growth Hacker TV. I'm Bronson Taylor, and today I have the legendary Steve Blank with us. Steve, thanks for coming on the show. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. Let me uh, tell our audience a little bit about you, um, just in case they don't know. You were previously a serial entrepreneur. You're a professor currently at some of the most prestigious institutes of higher learning. You teach an online class on entrepreneurship that has over 100,000 students. You're an author. Uh, the new edition of Four Steps to the Epiphany, I believe, just came out. You have a new book, The Startup Owner's Manual, that just came out. And you're an innovator of startup methodologies, for lack of a better way to put it. So even if startups don't know about you, they're probably deeply affected by the concepts that were either originated by you or popularized by you. So first of all, thank you for all the work you've done. <laughs> so you're welcome, uh, but, but you, you missed the most important thing, uh, which is I'm retired. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. <laughs> and so all the things you mentioned were done as a retired serial entrepreneur. I know, that's uh, I, right. I got to go home. Uh, that's right. And the other thing is I have a blog, steveblank.com, where a, a good number of the stories I, I write and the, the things I talk about are online. And a ton of material, uh, startup tools, a whole page of tools for entrepreneurs and slides and videos, uh, which are also resources for um, entrepreneurs as well. And all, all of it's free. Yeah, no, that's great. Uh, well, tell us about what you did before you retired. How about that? Talk to well, us about uh, your own kind of entrepreneurial journey, because if you've said it, uh, you've had some, you know, massive successes and some massive failures. So talk to us a little bit about that. Yeah, so, you know, the, the thing I realize now is uh, when I teach entrepreneurs um, is that I was definitely not as smart as my current students and not as kind of smart as the current crop of entrepreneurs. Uh, I learned how to be an entrepreneur via apprenticeship. Meaning, I, I didn't start a company in my 20s. I worked for in a variety of essentially marketing roles until eventually I became a co-founder and then a CEO. Um, and I did that in a period of eight startups in 20 years. Um, and so my entrepreneurial career, again, was one of learning. Um, and I'll give you a summary of what they are in a second. But before that, I had a couple of other interesting careers. Uh, during the Vietnam War, I spent four years in the Air Force and two of them in Southeast Asia, uh, uh, learning how to fix fighter planes. And then um, uh, my first uh, career in Silicon Valley was uh, um, as a contractor for uh, uh, a company now known as the Innovator in National Means of Technical Verification, which was a fancy way of saying in the Cold War, uh, we worked for the CIA, NSA, and National Reconnaissance Office. And by accident, I ended up in the middle of that. But uh -huh. uh, I very quickly joined, a, got out of the black world and, and joined a the world of uh, startups, and I did two microprocessor companies, uh, enterprise software company, threw in a video game company in there, a, a Macintosh consumer electronics company, and um, others I don't even remember. And the the kind of the box score at the end was uh, four IPOs, one of which, or maybe two of which, I had a lot to do with, uh, um, and uh, a couple of craters, one so deep it left its own iridium layer. I like to say, meaning it was a, it was a, one of them was a publicly massive failure. It was, uh, I was on the cover of Wired magazine, and 90 days later, I realized the company's going out of business. That's what I call a, a massive failure. Um, and uh, on, uh, you know, fortunately, out of that failure, I, it, no one likes to fail, and I got depressed like everybody else. But um, I was old enough at the time. I, I don't think I could have ever done this in my 20s and 30s. I actually reflected about which parts I owned and w which parts of my behavior and what I did and how I did it. And such that we, at least I took that out. And when we did our final startup, which was called Epiphany, um, we put those lessons to work and, and actually made both the team and the company and, and the way we managed it uh, work much better. Um, and then I retired uh, because uh, I wanted to see my kids grow up and they were seven and eight years old. and. You know, for everyone watching who does entrepreneurship, it's a 24-7 game. And it's very easy to lose family, marriage, children, etc. Mm -hmm. In fact, I lost one marriage when my wife once asked me, ex-wife, what's more important, me or your job? And when we realized I was still thinking about it for a minute, you know, we realized the marriage was over. And luckily, that one had no kids. But um, I had a lot of regrets because I made those choices. And... Um, um, and in fact, I've written a blog post about that called Epitaph for an Entrepreneur, which if you're an entrepreneur trying to figure out how to balance a family, I suggest you to go read it. It's not advice. It's just what we did um, to stay married, and I'm still married to the same woman now with my kids now in their 20s. 
who actually like to come home for the holidays. Mm -hmm. um, their choice, not mine. And, um, uh, and I guess I'm proudest of my entrepreneurship career that I managed to do both and got very lucky. So I was able to retire and then start thinking about what we knew about entrepreneurship and then essentially what became the Lean Startup Movement. Yeah, that's now, what was your, now, what was your question? <laughs> yeah, it doesn't really matter. <laughs> no, but so uh, as you built those companies, you've done a lot to rethink entrepreneurship and how to build a startup. Yeah. Was it your experiences doing it firsthand that really led to that rethinking? Or was it other things, watching, watching what other people were doing, that caused you to kind of rethink it? Gee, that's a really insightful question. Um, I think a combination of both, and, and I'm going to you know, just tell you and your audience a personal story is when I retired, all I knew was I wasn't going to do Startup 9. I mean, I had done eight startups in 20 years. I was going to go home. I didn't know what I was going to do. But, you know, I've always had a philosophy that says, um, you know, my best days are ahead of me. Um, so I was less so going to worry about what I was going to do. I, I knew I'd figure something out. I just knew it wasn't going to be another 24-7 whatever uh, and in uh, hindsight, what I'm about to tell you was actually a catharsis, but I thought it, I was actually doing something productive. I thought I'd write Steve's, you know, history of, you know, as an executive in Silicon Valley, and wouldn't people find that an interesting book? <laughs> <laughs> um, so I started writing, and I remember getting 80 pages into this, truly writing, you know, here was something I learned at Company X, and I would always punctuate it with what you see now on my blog, something called The Lessons Learned. And I truly was doing this, going through the history of eight companies. I must have got halfway to company four or five or maybe even six. And I realized, I still remember the moment, the hair started standing up in the back of my neck because I realized I was seeing a pattern I had never seen when I was deep down in those startups. And the pattern I was seeing was back then, every entrepreneur, believe it or not, thought they were on a singular journey. That is, that there was nothing you could learn from other service. Believe it or not, that's what we believed. And in fact, you know, what your VCs told you is write the business plan and then go execute the income statement and make the plan, the revenue plan. And when you failed to make the plan, they would beat you up in a board meeting and you'd sit there thinking you were possibly the only executive who never made the plan. Because remember, this is pre-net. None of us, the, the bandwidth was coffee. Right. I mean, it was limited to the bits you could exchange. And after so much caffeine, you're so wired, you can't have any more. Um, so imagine the bit rate being coffee back in the, you know, mm -hmm. pre net days. Um, and so the insight of, wait a minute, this isn't a singular journey. All my journeys had a common pattern. And wait a minute. By then, you know, I wasn't investing like a VC, but I was doing a bunch of angel investments. I was sitting on a couple of public boards. I was sitting on a ton of private boards. So I was seeing by the end of my career a lot of stuff. Mm -hmm. And I realized, wait a minute, this pattern is common to all startups. We've, we've never described that. In fact, the real insight was we've been treating startups like they were smaller versions of large companies. Mm -hmm. Holy crap. <laughs> what, <laughs> what's with that? Well, what, what was with that is, like, well, what else would you describe them as? Well, that took three years to answer that dumb question, but no one had ever articulated that question is, wait a minute, every time we try to act like a big company, we fail. Mm -hmm. Because what we're doing is, and this was, it took me a while to parse out the words, what we were trying to do was execute like we knew a series of facts. In fact, what we were doing was, back then, investor says, Go write a business plan. If, you, if I like it, I'll fund it. And then you'll execute to a revenue model. And you'll do waterfall engineering, alpha, then alpha test, beta test, first customer ship. And the only problem we're going to have is where do we put the bags of money? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and more importantly is post first customer ship, if in fact the, the actual revenue doesn't match the plan, it's obviously a failure of people. Mm -hmm. So the first thing we're going to do is fire the VP of sales to fix the problem. And when that doesn't work, you know, insert time delay, we'll fire the VP of marketing. And then finally, we'll fire the CEO. And if he's the founder, maybe we'll make him the, you know, chairman or something. But that's the process. Never once thinking that perhaps the problem isn't the people. Maybe the problem's the plan. Mm. Right? But we never assumed that how could the plan be wrong? I funded it, for God's sake. It must have been perfect. Mm -hmm. and, and all you needed to do is obviously execute the plan. This is a long soliloquy to say, 
What we never understood is that large companies execute a series of knowns. Most startups are actually searching through a series of unknowns. Mm -hmm. It's a big insight. And that big insight, that, that simple 30-second idea, as I describe it as no math is involved to try to understand this, mm -hmm. simply says, well, wait a minute. If startups are searching, what are the tools for search? And then you kind of go, oh, my God, we've built a whole set of management tools for execution. Where did we build them? In these things called business schools. Mm -hmm. Well, wait a minute. Where did those come from? Well, in the early 1900s, people observed, rightly so, that in the United States, there was a need for a managerial class to administer and execute growing companies. And there was no professional education to do that. So first Harvard as a graduate school and then others decided to set up something called the Masters of Business Administration. Administration. Not business start, but administration. <laughs> These were professional managers to administer. And by the way, for the next hundred years, they did an awesome job of building strategies and tools and you know finance classes and organizational theory classes and whatever and how to manage your 10,000 people. But none of those professors, none is probably a big word, but very few of them spent their time consulting for two-person startups and garages. Mm -hmm. Most of them spend their time, when they're not teaching, consulting for large corporations who could write large cash checks, mm -hmm. right? But no one said, well, what do we do with these new things? And that's not like they didn't think about entrepreneurship. The first class in entrepreneurship at a business school was in Harvard, 1947. And Miles Mace offered the first class while George Duro was teaching his famous manufacturing class. And Stanford, they offered a small business uh, entrepreneurship class in the mid-50s. But still, entrepreneurship was thought of as a smaller version. You, you know, whatever we did at GM, you're going to do just in smaller. Mm -hmm. So I grappled, to, now to answer your question, which I think I remember this time, is that I grappled for about three years trying to puzzle through, well, what tools should we do? What, what is it that make, differentiate the, the companies from, excuse me, yeah, the companies who are going public and drinking champagne versus, versus those who are selling off their furniture. Mm -hmm. um, and the distinction seemed to be is that startups that succeeded managed to get outside the building. That is, they seemed to understand the, the core idea was there are no facts inside your building, mm -hmm. and so they get the hell outside. And the interesting thing is, what do they do outside? Mm -hmm. And what they do outside is they listen a lot and they realize that what they just had was a series of untested hypotheses, not facts. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Absolutely. What kinds of facts are you looking for outside the building? Because that yeah. in itself can really narrow our focus and give us a lot of direction. Right. So, you know, for a long time, um, I used to make up these checklists and here are the things you need to worry about, or customers and all the logical things, until about three or four years ago, I ran into somebody named Alexander Osterwalder, mm -hmm. who wrote a book called Business Model Generation. And what I, the, that book and something called the Business Model Canvas was the missing piece in the lean startup. You know, for 20 years, academics have been using the word business model, and VCs throw it, threw it around like they actually knew what it meant. Uh, but it was ill-defined. It was basically the sum of things you needed to do uh, to deliver products and services to companies at the same time the things you needed to do internally to build profit and revenue. And a business model, this is the one that used to confuse me, is different than the org chart. A business model is not whether you have sales, marketing, engineering, manufacturing, you know, revenue, growth hacker, that's org chart stuff. A business model says, what are the components? Forget about how we're going to execute it. What are the pieces we need to worry about? What are the hypotheses that make up our business? And Osterwalder did a pretty darn good job. Um, and, and I say darn good job because academics will be arguing about it for another 20 years, but it's good enough to execute. He said, look, I could draw nine boxes on the wall, and you need to worry about these nine. Maybe a couple others, but boy, if you're not worrying about these, you're going to get screwed because you need to worry about who are your customers. Pretty obvious, right? What are you building for them? The value proposition. So value proposition, customer segment, those first two things have a special name. We call it product market fit, right? So if you don't have features and pains and gains managing customer segments and archetypes and needs, if you don't have this, the rest of what we're about to talk about is kind of silly. Mm -hmm. 
Mm-hmm. So we spend a lot of time looking at value proposition versus customer segment. Then you need to worry about channel. And then on the web, it might be you are selling off your own website, but you also might be going through affiliates and other things, et cetera. In physical products, you know, channels could be direct sales or value-added resellers or system integrators or OEMs, et cetera. Then you worry about what he calls customer relationships, but what Ann Mira Co and I, Ann from Floodgate, uh, kind of relabeled get, keep, and grow customers. That is, how do we do acquisition, activation, um, you know, uh, uh, reduce attrition and churn, loyalty, et cetera, uh, and then how do we do cross-sell, upsell, next sell? Um, then how do, how do we worry about revenue streams, which actually is sum of revenue models, are you subscription or, or direct sales or licensing, and pricing, which is a tactic, and the sum of the two revenue models and, and um, uh, pricing make up revenue streams. Then on the left side of the canvas, we worry about, do we need any partners? You know, iPod and iPhone without uh, content would just be a, another piece of nice hardware and, and system software. Um, any special resources, any special activities, and what are those costs? That canvas, while it seems complicated, on day one, what we teach is every startup needs to get nine sticky notes and write down their hypotheses on day one. Oh, yeah, of course, these are our customers. Oh, for sure, this is what they're going to want to buy. Great, here's how much they're going to want to pay. <clears throat> or in what's called the multi-sided market, no, 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 we'll have all these users, which is one customer segment, and then we'll have payers over here. And the payers you know, will pay for it, but the users will have you know, zero and will create demand and blah, blah, blah. That's all great, but what we now know is on day one, a startup is nothing more than a faith-based enterprise. <laughs> it's a religious activity. I can't convince you you're wrong because you believe, which is what it takes to be a founder, but the reality is it's a pretty safe bet that you're effing wrong. Right? Mm-hmm. And not, maybe not about everything, but you're probably really wrong. Mm-hmm. And now, so the question is, how do we like reduce the pain of failure? And this is when we come up with all the words of minimum viable product and the idea of pivots and the idea of, you know, iterations and even restarts that now kind of have found its way into the lexicon, but they're all designed to reduce the cost of failure. Mm-hmm. In fact, the, the other big insight I had was, it was one of these is startups don't go from success to success. I mean, some corner cases do, but most of them go from failure to failure. And what world-class founders are great at doing is reinventing the past. Mm-hmm. Oh, I thought of it. That's, that was my original idea. You know, that wasn't the original Apple II idea. It was like, you know, they were going to like put the single board computer in a nice wooden box. <laughs> <right>? <laughs> and then, you know, then Jobs have, have being the master of like reinventing the past, you know, managed to have a great ear and a great eye for customer needs and desires. Does yeah. that? No, that's answer? great. I mean, that, I just want to let you keep talking because everything you say is so great. So let me ask you now, this. So, so just, to, just to, for context, by the way, the lean startup, as I define it, and again, you'll find different definitions from Eric Reese and Osterwalder and others, but my version um, says, look, it's composed of three components that every founder needs to know. One is you need to understand your business model. Go buy Osterwalder's book. Mm-hmm. Two is you need to understand some out-of-the-building customer discovery and validation process, meaning, okay, you got these hypotheses. You know what? I don't believe a single one of them. Prove to me I'm an idiot, Mm -hmm. right? So go out and let's run a series of experiments with MVPs and pivots and the rest and go see if this is is real. And then third is we need some type of agile engineering process because we discovered, you know, that waterfall is a pretty dumb way to spend your money. Why don't we build the product incrementally and iteratively? And by the way, this contribution of Agile and customer development together, the, the steps two and three, was Eric Reese's major, just like huge insight. I had come up with a customer development process, but Eric was the first one to ever actually implement it, and he smacked me in the side of the head and said, Steve, <laughs> you know, we don't use waterfall anymore. <laughs> like, you're an old guy. <laughs> Let me explain to you how we built product. And I'm like, really? <laughs> oh, now this actually makes sense. And then it was Osterwalder's piece. And by the way, the canonical description of Lean Now is uh, the cover of the May uh, 2013 Harvard Business Review has a great summary article written by me. <laughs> I was going to say. <laughs> but, you, but you could get it for free on my website, uh, steveblank.com. If you just click uh, to the website and you'll see it on the right on the sidebar, just click on the icon. And you can kind of read a, you know, a, a layman's version if you want to explain Lean to your mother. Mm-hmm. Um, 
trust me, you, you believe it or not, HBR took out all the multi-syllable words, so it's kind of easily understood. Yeah, um, so those three components, for me, are kind of the religion. And, and I find it very funny when I now teach students, like they go, so how else would you build a startup? <laughs> right? And I go, you wouldn't believe what we were doing. Yeah. Um, well, let's, let's really hone in on one of those pieces. I want to hone in on customer development because yeah. I feel like that piece of the pie that you just described is going to have a lot of overlap with growth hacking because growth hacking is all about you know users retaining them, acquiring them, those kind of things. Yeah. Um, tell me first, how do you define customer development? What's the, you know, I can explain to my mother definition, like you said. <laughs> so customer development simply says um, a couple, but there's maybe two or three principles. One is there are no facts inside your building. Um, and, and the color of that is you're, you're might be the smartest person in your building. Let's just take that as a given. But there's no way just computationally you're smarter than the collective intelligence of your potential customer. Mm -hmm. Right? Even in a new market. And we'll describe market types in a second. But mm -hmm. um, So why don't we, you know, just like engineers love to argue, you know. So let's, let's go have that argument. Are you smarter than the collective? I guess not. Okay. Mm -hmm. Well, let's just assume you're a genius. Since I'm giving you the money, humor me. And let's run a series of cheap experiments. And so customer development is actually the process that in, in which we test those hypotheses around the business model. And, and customer development, and I'll also contend growth hacking, doesn't work if you believe that your plan and idea were given to you by God, mm -hmm. right? It, it, or you're a first-time entrepreneur, with both of them seem to be synonymous, right? <laughs> it's, it's only after you've failed a couple of times that you kind of realize that maybe you know, we should have some process. I, yeah. I find this very interesting with teaching. That's why I like to teach grad students, because they've had some experience not succeeding, but mm -hmm. screwing it up. And then they go, really, there's a process? I really want to learn this. Mm -hmm. um, does that give No, you absolutely. Some... What, what does that process look like? Make it really tangible. Because so, I want so, people uh, watching this to know, right. like, what does it look like? Yeah. So uh, I'm going to just describe the canonical case, not just for web mobile, but in general. And then we could dive mm -hmm. deeper if, you, if you'd like. Mm -hmm. So the first set of assumptions, forget the business model canvas that any great founder has implicitly. And this one, like, troubled me for years is implicitly you're building something because you believe you're either solving a problem or fulfilling a need, mm -hmm. right? Problem solving is some kind of like app for spreadsheets or accounting or it solves a problem. Needs are, you know, basic hardwired human needs. I need to communicate, sex, you know, dating, gambling, you know, entertainment, all fun, fall under the need categories. And so I tend to uh, put startups kind of into those two buckets. Um, mm -hmm. Because problems are kind of like change over time, but needs are kind of hardwired into human beings. That's what makes us human. Um, and by the way, just as an aside, if you look at social media and entertainment and all the um, huge uh, total available market uh, opportunities, they've all been attacking moving what we used to do face to face to something that's now mediated by computer, just mm -hmm. like this conversation. You and I used to like physically would have to meet and you know, some molecules would actually exchange at pheromones or something. Mm -hmm. But now we do this via computer. And that's what Twitter is, that's what Facebook is, that's what online porn is, that's what you know, um, video games, or Zynga is. Um, hardwired stuff that we used to do, we're not inventing the category, the category used to exist. By the way, total available market for those, six billion people. Mm -hmm. Very interesting. Hardwired into human psyche. Mm -hmm. Problems are, you know, not everybody, not six billion people have a quicken problem, you know, an accounting problem. <laughs> yeah. All right. So the first thing is to answer your question is, at its core, every founder believes that their insight is that they're solving a problem or fulfilling a need. Great. Let's start with that. Mm -hmm. How do you know that? Well, Steve, I believe, and, and not only do I believe, me and my friends in the dorm believe. Wonderful. Great. <laughs> so now what? Oh, we're now going to write the code. And well, well, wait a minute. Have you asked anybody else? Well, why should I? I believe it's my idea. Now, by the way, this is the extreme version because I also teach scientists and engineers who'd say, Steve, I've been working on this in the lab for the last 15 years. Of course everybody wants it, which, by the way, is the same, the same problem. It's just because just you've been working on it for 10 years. I, I'm not, in fact, it's sometimes of a worse problem. Is like, mm -hmm. you know, no one else might actually care. And so the first test of getting out of the building is, can you verify that somebody other than you actually has the problem? 
mm-hmm. or the need. Oh, Steve, that should be easy. We'll just go up. Great. Great. You believe it's going to be easy? Why don't we quantify what easy looks like? Let's, in fact, take that problem hypothesis and design an experiment. What's an experiment? Well, the experiment is I believe that 300 people are going to believe that, you know, writing messages in 140 characters is a great idea. Or better, I believe actually 140 characters is the wrong number. I believe what they really need today is 189 characters. And so I'm going to go out and test whether I can move people off of 140 characters to 189. Great. Well, that's a good test. How are we going to run the test? Well, I'm going to call on whatever and I'm going to give them a wireframe or I'm going to let them type in whatever. Great. What kind of results should you see? Oh, what I'm going to see is, you know, 100% of the people are going to want to drop Twitter and use my app. Wonderful. Great. What's the pass-fail number? Oh, well, 90%. I I think it's great. Good. Let's go run out and try that experiment. Does that make sense? Absolutely. That's a problem. Yeah. Now it's tangible. Right. And, by the way, what I really just jumped to is problem and solution. Because the the first thing you really want to understand is do people have the problem? The next thing you want to test is, well, would they actually like the solution? Uh, and, you know, what you're trying to understand is, you know, can I test that solution in wireframe? Can I test it in a PowerPoint slide? Can I test it in a mobile mock-up? Should I test it, by the way, some testing is, can I test it in a Kickstarter, which is the world's, you know, it's the world's biggest pile of stupid money? I mean... <laughs> <laughs> but I think of Kickstarter as like um, marketing demand creation thermometer rather than like anything else useful. I mean, mm-hmm. you, know, you know, Pebble sold 10 million bucks, but it, it, I mean, those are outliers, but it is a great test bed for the people really want the solution. Mm-hmm. And then I want you to march through all, all the physical pieces of the business model. Help me understand the archetypes of the customer segment. The mm-hmm. goal is, what's an archetype? You know, demographic, psychographic, geographic, whatever. And how many archetypes are there? Typically, in a business, you're not just selling to, you know, women 29 and a half years old who are living in this square block of Manhattan. Mm-hmm. You might be having, you know, multiples inside. And which archetypes are more likely to buy when? What's the, you know, what's their average uh, purchase price, etc.? And I want to understand all that. I want to understand which features do they really care about on day one, which are critical, which are, you know, the sum of are necessary. Wait a minute. The, and by the way, is this a multi-sided market? By the way, multi-sided market means you might have multiple customer segments with different archetypes, but those customer segments might actually be different in, as well. There might be, you know, users and buyers, but these might be payers. The key idea is for every customer segment, you need a value proposition. Mm-hmm. You need a revenue model. You need a acquisition activation path, right? You it's need almost a two separate companies, right? It might be so. So in web mobile, my my the example I start with in my class is Google, right? And I go, great, you know, who are the customers? And everybody raises up steep. It's a stupid questions like who's buried in grand student? We're all customers. Great. How much do you pay? <laughs> well, we don't pay anything. Well, Google is one of the most profitable companies on earth. Who the hell is paying? Are they smuggling dope? I mean, what the hell are they doing? Yeah. Oh, they're payers. Oh, well, the payers the same as the users? Well, they not might be, but they're actually paying for something. Well, what are they paying for? Oh, well, their value proposition is very different than yours, the user. Okay, so now we can understand users and payers of Google, two different value props. Mm-hmm. Oh, well, wait a minute. Users, by the way, don't pay anything, so their revenue model is zero. But how do payers pay? Oh, there's a very unique revenue model. It's pay per click. Well, how much do they pay? Oh, well, that depends on, you know, value the keywords, et cetera. So the pricing is different than the revenue model, which is pay per click. Mm -hmm. How do we acquire users? Well, in Google, it's word of mouth, right? And by the way, I don't know about you, but I've never seen Google launch their product. They never did, right? But how do they get payers? Oh, there's an entire sales force. Right. Well, there's a self-service component um, for buying keywords. There's an entire sales force working with large companies to go do that. So now all of a sudden we can understand even for a simple web model, there are users and payers. Mm-hmm. Now, just I know it's not um, your audience, but when I teach students who are building medical devices, this gets even more fun. <laughs> well, who are the users? So assume you're coming up with a new artificial hip. And somebody says, oh, we're building it for my grandmother and needs a new hip. And I go, great, is she putting it in herself? <laughs> well, no, I guess there are doctors. Perfect. Now we have users and doctors, you know, customers and doctors. Great. Can the doctor put in a hip in his garage? 
Oh no, he has to go to a hospital. Okay, so now we have users, doctors, and hospitals. Who pays for the hip? <laughs> Do you take a grandma, take out her credit card? No, there's insurance. Well, gee, can will they reimburse any hip? No, you need to get something called the CPT code. Okay, so now we have you know customers, we have doctors, we have hospitals, we have insurance companies. Now, can can you still make any hip and just kind of put it in? Oh no, there's the FDA. You're right. For you need either what's called the 510K or a PMA which is approval process. Mm -hmm. Now we have five different customer segments we need to play with on day one before we even start our business, all with their own value props, all with their own pricing, all with their mm -hmm. own, does this make sense? Absolutely. Um, but, but you know what? Once you start uh, seeing like a head-up display like you're using Google Glass, anytime I now hear somebody describing their business, I'm popping up a business model canvas overlay, which is the 2D version, mm -hmm. and then I'm thinking, how are they going to run experiments on each one of those hypotheses and which ones are critical for them to figure out before they even you know, think about anything else? Yeah. Just, just as an aside, my favorite is still, you would think after 50 years that we'd stop doing this. You, you know, I find startups still arguing about their logo <laughs> you know, like, and their name. Uh -huh. How about we worry about product market fit yet? And I don't care what it's called. Yeah, we'll, get, mean, we'll get the t-shirts made later. Well, you know, and by the way, you're talking about the guy who used to be the king of t-shirts and crap. I mean, I, 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 I had a budget of $100,000 my first year, I swear to God. Oh, wow. <laughs> I would have shot me now. Uh -huh. I mean, well, How about we worry about like finding the right customer segment and figuring out whether engineering is building the right product? Yeah. When Sorry. it comes to customer development, you know, you've kind of mentioned the first hurdle is getting them to want to do it, getting them to realize it needs to be done. Once they're on board with that, they realize, yes, I think I know what I don't actually know, and they're yeah. outside the building. What's the next hurdle? Is it coming to grips with what they find? Is it something else? What do you see in your experience as the next hurdle for customer development? Right. So... So A, it's hard because it's counterintuitive to a great, passionate entrepreneur. Let me just emphasize again. It's hard, mm -hmm. not because it's physically hard, because emotionally you're wired for action and somehow you don't think this is action. Or worse, you're afraid of cognitive dissonance of somebody mm -hmm. saying your baby's ugly mm -hmm. and realizing not only weren't you holding it upside down, it actually was right side up. You know, <laughs> It's like, how can it be ugly? It's, it's my idea because a key part of customer development is you can't outsource it. Oh, I hire some consultants. No, because here's what's great about getting out of the building. If, you're, if you send this to some consultants and say, well, why don't you do a survey? And they find the product sucks. And you come back and tell the founding CEO who hired you, Steve, we talked to a bunch of people. Product sucks. The first thing they're going to say is why? What do you think they'll say the first time a consultant comes back or a VP of sales says it sucks? It's something wrong with the user. Yeah, you know, they just don't get it, yeah. or you just don't, or you're just not explaining it right. Go yeah. back again. Something's right? broken that's not so me. They, right. <laughs> so they go back again, and they come back with even more data that says it sucks. What, what do you think the second thing gets said? Now you're going to the wrong segment of the population. <laughs> Maybe, but if you're working for me, you're fired. <laughs> <laughs> okay, there you go. <laughs> right? But now imagine I'm on your board, and I go, that's great, but customer development is done by the founders. Get the hell outside, and you need to hear that data. Mm -hmm. What do you think happens the first couple of times you hear the data? Well, the first couple of times, you still think something's wrong with them. You bet. Yeah. They're idiots. They don't get it. About the five times, five through ten, though me, it usually took 20 or 40, <laughs> smoke starts coming out of your own ears because cognitive dissonance is setting in. Mm -hmm. Now, you could still say they don't get it because you're in a new market, and you know, it's, it, uh, I'll explain market types in, in a minute. But it might be that you have to deal with this, but you as a founder could do something no proxy can. What is it that you could do? You can change the product. You bet. Only founders could pivot. Mm -hmm. It's a key idea. Only mm -hmm. founders could pivot. But you can't pivot on secondhand data because what the hell do you know? Exactly. So the, key I so the key idea of getting out of the building is if you're using the word pivot and you haven't left your desk or your office <laughs> or have not made eye contact with potential customers, and by the way, customer discovery requires the ability to see someone's pupils dilate. And that means it's not done by SurveyMonkey. Mm -hmm. It's done either by video Skype or in-person interviews. Because I want to know, am I looking at my watch? Am I distracted over here? Am I reading my email or mm -hmm. whatever? You can't tell that in a, in a SurveyMonkey and whatever. Nor can you ask what to me is the world's best customer discovery question which is the last one I've now trained thousands of students to ask, which is as you're leaving, you ask, 
what else should I have asked you? Mm -hmm. And that sometimes, that's another half hour going, well, I thought you were going to talk about X, because why? Well, X is my most important problem. <laughs> <There you go. laughs> All right, throw away the script, and let's now talk about that. Yeah. And sometimes, here, I'll give you another example. I swear this happened in my, now I'm about to talk about Stanford graduate students, okay. right? <laughs> trying, to, trying to price a mobile app. You know, Professor Blank, we spoke to 50 people on our pricing week. Great. Well, what did you decide? Nine ninety nine is the price. <laughs> what a surprise! <laughs> okay, nine ninety nine. You know that took a bunch of genius, right? Uh -huh. And you got into Stanford. That's great. Uh, so why did you conclude that? Well, forty seven out of fifty said nine ninety nine was the right price. Great. What did the other three say? Oh, that's so silly. You know, uh, and I'm looking at their data because we make them use a tool to automate this process called Launchpad Central. And I look at their data and I said, I want you to stand up in front of the entire class and tell them what the other three people you discarded said. <laughs> and they said, oh, well, it's, it was obvious. These people were crazy. Well, tell the class what they said. They said, well, we paid tens of thousands of dollars for this product. Oh. We added these three new features. <laughs> why don't you tell the class why you like discarded the data? Well, that would take us another four months. <laughs> <laughs> and so then I said, you know, did you ask those three people if they had any more friends? <laughs> well, no, we never did. <laughs> and so this is a common customer discovery mistake, is thinking that, A, it's maybe a focus group, or that you're looking for the sum of the data. Mm. And this is a big, inst big idea. Mm -hmm. You're not looking for the data. You're looking for the insight in the data. Any fool could gather data. So, and on the web, it's really easy to get tons of data. Right, so if you want to have a nice small company, you know, keep you know optimizing the data. And again, there are some people who are great at that and make that a nice, profitable million-dollar-a-year business. And if you're living in your dorm, you know, all power to you. I tended not to want to build million-dollar companies. I wanted to build you know hundred millions or billion-dollar companies. So I was looking for is there something like I've just been ignoring? You know. Uh, I think the Twitter analogy, you know, going from IDEO to Twitter was one of those insights. Or going from, you know, Facebook being a, you know, hot or not thing into something a lot more general was one of those insights about what was the, what is the, the bigger idea here? Mm -hmm. No, that's Sorry. great insight. I love that. Now, so, by the way, just, just one other thing I should mention yeah. to your audience. And it's even true uh, in web mobile apps and this notion of market type which doesn't get talked about because it hurts your head to think about <laughs> it turns out we in the English language only have one word for startup and that word is startup <laughs> it turns out really that there are four types of startups and if you don't know who you are you're screwed and here's one there's a startup entering an existing market Steve's definition of an existing market is you have a higher performance product, not cheaper, not, but better in some axis as defined by the existing customers. Mm -hmm. And because we're calling it an existing market by definition, the market exists because there are customers, there are competitors, the customers can tell you the name of the market, and if you ask them doing customer discovery, they could tell you what what features are important. Mm -hmm. They could tell you what the basis of company. They'll even tell you the pricing. Existing markets are fun. So if you're in an existing market, go out and do discovery and ask the classic questions. Mm -hmm. There's another type of existing market where the incumbents are so strong that you going against them head on, regardless of how much discovery, you know, people hate Microsoft. Great, let's build another operating system. <laughs> Probably a bad idea. Mm -hmm. But you might decide, no, but Microsoft isn't strong in servers, so let's build Linux, you know, or something else. Um, so you might decide that you want to go around an incumbent because you know two things. You might know that people will actually put up with 80% of the features for 20% of the price or some trade off mm -hmm. because you've actually done a ton of discovery. And I call this a resegmented market. You might decide you're going to resegment by price. Or in a physical product, let's build it in China. It's cheap, but like people really don't care about quality. Mm -hmm. right? But there's another type of uh, resegmentation which says, I know something about a specific set of user needs in this broad horizontal market, and I'm going to enter there. That's, that's niche resegmentation. Mm -hmm. And there's a third version called Blue Ocean Strategy, but I won't beat that to death. So existing resegmentation. All you could do, traditional, get out of the building, ask customers questions, customer discovery. Mm -hmm. There's a third type of market, which is the one Steve Jobs used to say, well, we don't do any market research. 
And that's when you're creating something new. Mm -hmm. It's a new market. What's a new market? Well, you ask people, well, you know, what features? And they're looking at you like you're from Mars because mm -hmm. there is no market. There is no competitors. There is no competition. There is no users. There is no pricing. Yeah. You are a visionary. You see something. And so people then go, well, why should I get out of the building then? There's nobody to add. In fact, the, it's like a divide by zero answer. Why would I go? And, and the answer is, well, yes, you could decide you're such a genius. You could sit in a lead-lined room in the Zen Lotus position with lightning bolts coming out of your head. But the odds are you really need to understand something different going on outside. You implicitly believe that the world is going to change from here to there. Mm -hmm. I want you to be able to draw for me the day in the life of a customer now and when the world changes. Mm -hmm. Tell me what has to happen. And the odds of you being able to do that in detail, sitting in your office, pretty low. I mean, you might, but pretty low. So therefore, the type of customer discovery and development you do is not the same as an existing or resegmented market, but actually is customer discovery. You're just asking different questions and you're trying to get a deeper and different understanding. By the way, the reason why understanding market type is important, if you're in an existing market, your job in year one is to take share for the, from the incumbents. And you do a traditional launch. You, in fact, you launch with everything you got. Once you've got product market fit, don't sit around. For God's sake, move. Mm -hmm. Spend money when it matters to get share. Now imagine you get that exact same pile of cash and you try that in a new market. You might as well throw the money in the street mm -hmm. because there is no market and doing an, a you know great launch and big blog and press event. In fact, in a new market, what you're doing is guerrilla activities trying to find the tipping point and tip the market for adoption. Yeah. In a new market, the revenue curve is the canonical hockey stick. Yeah. In an existing market, it's a straight line. The last type is a clone market. If any of your viewers are in India or China or you know Brazil or Russia, in markets that where there are populations north of 100 million people, regulatory barriers, language barriers, etc., you take a U.S. business model, you clone it, and you put your name on it, and boom, you're in business. But you still need to do customer discovery in understanding what the right way to adapt, adopt, and clone mm -hmm. is. So understanding market type, while a little more difficult, really, in fact, affects who you are, how you spend money, and how you do customer discovery. And in fact, in fact, the entire lean startup. Yeah, I'm so glad you went into market types because one of the criticisms that I hear of lean startup and customer development yeah. is, but what about Apple? And I've actually right. never heard a great answer, to be honest. Right. But what you just said is, yeah, what about Apple? They're one kind of market and there's still right. customer development to be done. It's just right. different. It doesn't and, take anything away from it. Right. And, and so, you know, and, and Apple PR has probably done the worst um, uh, disservice to entrepreneurs everywhere <laughs> of, again, promoting that Jobs just sat in the corner and great lightning bolts came out of his head. Mm -hmm. um, you know, Jobs probably was the best intersection of a, of a CEO for art and science in the 21st century uh, uh, and, and probably the equivalent of Henry Ford. But, you know, that canonical, if I would have asked customers what they wanted, I would have gotten, given them a six-legged horse. Uh -huh. You know, that's just a bunch of BS. It wasn't Henry Ford just like sat in his, his shop and came up with the automobile. He actually spent a long time trying to understand, you know, what it is customers wanted and why. And he actually executed on that hypothesis. Mm -hmm. Jobs had a great insight about the revolution in, in, in putting computers on everybody's desks in the, from the 70s to the 80s. And then again, in everybody's pockets in the 21st century. Does yeah. that answer the question? No, that's great. Now, I have yeah. to ask this next question just because of who my audience is. They're yeah. interested in acquiring new customers and retaining yeah. the ones they have. In your opinion, if customer development is done well, does that yeah. make customer acquisition and retention a magnitude order easier later, or is it not related? Of, of course it does. Um, think about it, right? <laughs> you know, the most expensive part is... Uh, uh, of, of any sales pipeline, you know, of any growth hacker is customer acquisition and activation, right? Once you got them, it's a lot easier to re retain them than to acquire them, right? Mm -hmm. Depending on the industry, the number varies from, you know, 3x to 10x and, you know, but, but let's just agree. It's a, so the question is, who are they? <laughs> what the hell do they like about you? And like, what are the things that keep them coming back? And, mm -hmm. you know, so all the numbers you start thinking about up front about acquisition and activation, you should also be thinking about, well, wait a minute, what if I changed the lifetime value? You know, mm -hmm. what if, in fact, you know, I changed 
you know, lifetime value by cross-sell, upsell, next sell, what if I change retention, eliminated churn, etc. So, by the way, in the Startup Owner's Manual, the, which was the book after the Four Steps of the Epiphany, we had a huge section on basically unraveling Dave McClure's, you know, the ARG uh, mm -hmm. uh, pitch, which kind of started a good uh, bunch of the growth hacking uh, thinking, in, in basically a double-barreled uh, sales funnel where you have people coming in one side, you try to retain them, and then you try to grow them again on the other side. I tend to think of this visually is you, you want to like not just worry about acquisition and activation, you want to worry about the entire lifetime of these customers. Does that make no, sense? No, absolutely. Now, and, and by the way, startups are you know so desperate just to get them in, you kind of forget <laughs> that there's the other part of the funnel. <laughs> keep them and make a pile of money from them. And the, I mean, unless you have some other goal, which you could have is I want to flip the company or I want to sell it to you know Google or Facebook, mm -hmm. and then maybe you'll optimize for other things. But I don't know how to do that. I just yeah. tend to give advice on how to build sustainable companies over time and that requires not only focusing on the front end activities mm -hmm. but focusing on the entire pipeline and to answer your question again is unless you have a deep knowledge of let me explain who the archetypes are and by the way I got pictures of them you know in, in front of the engineers with their names and you know as a here's Sally here's who she is and you're building for her and they're you know and Jose is next to her and Vinod is you know next to him all on the wall and we all understand that's who we're building for then it, it's too abstract yeah now let me ask you this customer development as you've described it here does it ever cease to exist in a startup or does it become something else does it become you know, uh, the community building? Does it become marketing? Or should it always survive as a standalone piece that you're working on? How do you see that going forward? So let me tell you the first time I did this in a larger company. Um, I took over a, a marketing in a company that had gone Chapter 11. It was a company. Sounds fun. In, yeah, in, in, in the dim past. But it made peripherals for the Mac. And um, it was called Super Mac. Uh, and... Uh, one of the things I realized is no one in the marketing department, which was when I got it, it was 14. I made sure we got it down to four before we got it back up to 40. Uh -huh. um, but no one in marketing was actually connected to customers. They were connected to activities. Oh, I do trade shows. Oh, I do you know PR. Oh, I do whatever. What does anybody do like talking to customers? So this is back before the web. I, I know it's hard to remember, or even your grandparents could probably tell you about those days, but we used to get physical registration cards of customers. And so I made it as a requirement is you had to talk to two customers a week to attend my marketing staff meeting. And by the way, attendance at the staff meeting was a requirement for your continued employment in the company. So therefore, it wasn't optional. <laughs> so it, was kind of, it took you a while to realize, oh, not optional. Well, just do the math. Eventually, when I have 40 people, we're talking to 80 customers a week. Mm -hmm. Over a year, you know, plus or minus, we were talking to three to 4,000 customers personally. Mm -hmm. Personally. And, and yes, it was by telephone. But we had a series of questions. Then we would ask open-ended questions. These were people going, who is this company that actually cares about? And we were using that data. In fact, We'd have arguments in the marketing staff meeting. I knew by week three when the first fight broke out mm -hmm. that I had won. We were arguing about what customers wanted, mm -hmm. not like what color was the damn logo. Mm -hmm. um, and so the, I'm trying to tell the story is to say, why, of course. And in fact, when I find companies who build you know, marketing or growth hacking or whatever, as they get larger and turn into execution organizations, without this constant iteration with customers, you kind of lost the mojo because some other startup's going to eat your lunch. Yeah. And, and the answer is there's no magic in like somehow talking to them will sprinkle fairy dust, but you will still keep your finger on the pulse of what are they reading, what's changing, who do they see, you know. But when you ask these questions of like, well, what else are you looking at, or did you have a bad experience with us? Man, to be able to hear that stuff real time, and then when. My department would bring that into the rest of the company. We were the only people with facts. Mm -hmm. Everybody else was, well, I think. Well, we never thought. We said, let me explain to you the data we have. And then because I was pretty creative with it, you know, and here's what I think we should do. Really became, oh, does that help? Yeah, no, it's great. Now, despite all that you've done in your career to promote better startup practices, better mm -hmm. methods, what do you see right now as the cardinal sin? Um, are, is there any one piece of the pie that is just still lagging behind in terms of the things you're trying to teach startups? 
Yeah, I think incubators and accelerators and um, are uh, 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 toxic beauty contests for uh, <laughs> entrepreneurs. All right, you have to unpack that for us. If you, th if you think about what their business model is, and, and uh, not to diss their model, I think it makes sense, is you know they want to select a elite group of teams and they want to get them funded, mm -hmm. and, and therefore demo day is in fact their graduation present, right? Mm -hmm. And the number of companies they're putting through the process limits you know how what those companies can communicate, and I believe that what they're starting to communicate actually is bullshit. Um, is who could you know write the prettiest slides and give the most aggressive speech? Mm -hmm. But what really I think, um, and I now have some data I'll share with you in a second is, um, I don't think that that means that these companies have learned crap. Um, I I think what we really want to have is a lessons learned day, not a demo day. Mm -hmm. That is, tell me what you learned. And by the way, what you learned is not a point in time. Tell me where you were, and then. How'd you get from A to B to C to D and tell me that story in three minutes because I know you're going to still be learning and I want to know that I got the smartest SOBs who are capable of quick, cheap, whatever iteration and you're on a path and now you need money to kind of like improve or scale or whatever. Mm -hmm. Not that I have a demo and great slides and my font looks pretty. Um, and I'll give you a, a, a A-B test. Um, I teach this class, and this is the online class, at least the lectures are there, called the Lean Launchpad at Stanford and Berkeley at Columbia. Um, about two and a half years ago, the U.S. government adopted the class as the standard for commercializing all science in the United States. Go figure. <laughs> right? It's go. like, <laughs> what the hell? Um, it turns out the government has a program called the SBIR program that says um, they're mandated to give out 3% of their funds for research organizations to commercialize anybody who raises their hand. And so for 30 years, we've been giving away 500000 and then million-dollar grants to companies uh, without training them what to do. <laughs> so it was like giving away cars without driver's ed. Uh -huh. And what a surprise. They would crash the cars, but the, but the Congress never bothered to ask, how are they doing? They were just interested that we were spending the money. Mm -hmm. And finally, the National Science Foundation, the institution that f funds all science and research in the U.S. Uh, in, uh, universities, except for medical, which is done by the NIH, said – this ain't working for us. They saw my class, asked me to put one on for them. We built a prototype. It worked so well, they've scaled it to now 11 universities teach 400 teams a year. Mm -hmm. right? so it's, and it's called the Innovation Corps. That's interesting, but what's real interesting is, but there were a ton of teams that weren't joining the Innovation Corps. So they essentially had an accidental A-B test for the last two and a half years. Mm -hmm. So all I could do is tell you the results as they reported it to date, mm -hmm. which I didn't believe when I heard it. The control group, who've been doing stuff like they've always been doing, funding rate from both government and private capital at the end, over multiple over the last two and a half years, 18%. Innovation Corps, or my class, mm -hmm. right? funding rate, 60%. Wow. That is quite the difference. So, again, the numbers are biased, and gee, maybe the people who got in were the best ones, and maybe, or at least they were funding the ones who got in. You know, it, mm -hmm. it kind of just says that maybe we're teaching the wrong things. Mm -hmm. For If we did a longitudinal study of the intersection between the output of incubators or, and accelerators and early-stage VCs, I think we're asking the wrong thing, and yeah. I think that interface is not yet optimal. No one's being stupid or bad or whatever. Mm -hmm. I just think we're now learning a lot. And I'm going to offer a class this fall um, in September. I now teach 100 educators a year how to teach this class, this Lean Launchpad class. We're going to offer our first class for incubators and accelerators who want to use the same techniques the National Science mm -hmm. Foundation is using. Um, and we're going to try to see if we could get some people to adopt you know, the, the first generation was guru-based. The next generation of incubators and accelerators were mentor-based. And I'm not suggesting we get rid of any of those. I'm now just suggesting that we add some curriculum and evidence-based entrepreneurship. And that key phrase, evidence-based entrepreneurship, is I think what's been missing from demo days is, is the fact that you could, you know, project a good reality distortion field is clearly an important part of what you're doing. But actually having product market fit and revenue and customers and some some evidence that that you have anything other than good fonts would be useful. Yeah. Now, given the success of a class like the one you teach that you just told us the stats for, 
you must believe that entrepreneurship can be learned to some degree. Is that accurate? Well, I think the key question is some degree. Um, for those who knew me as, a, um, as an entrepreneur, they laughed hysterically when they heard I was an educator because their first <laughs> reaction was, Steve, you're you know born entrepreneur. You can't teach you this stuff. What are you thinking? Mm -hmm. And boy, that troubled me for a decade because I knew I was teaching something. And, it was, mm -hmm. and, and, so, and I finally realized the following. We've been asking the wrong question. Of course you can teach entrepreneurship. The real way to frame the question, and let me pass it back to you, is, Steve, who can you teach entrepreneurship to? Mm -hmm. That is, you can't teach it to anybody. It's like asking a, a room full of people. How many of you want to be sculptors and artists? You don't assign sculpture and art to one room and the other half get to work on the factory floor. It doesn't work that way. People who are artists, sculptors or composers or painters, they have something inside of them that they see or hear that no one else has. And in fact, they want to learn these skills just so they could get that out of them. Mm -hmm. and, but, but you know what? It's not the skills that are going to make them great. The skills will, it, will help them. Yeah. Um, but but it's, it's a passion. Yeah. The mistake we made about entrepreneurship education was confusing it with teaching accounting. Mm -hmm. right? <laughs> no, accounting is a job. Yeah, you don't need passion. <laughs> entrepreneurship is passion driven, and that's the biggest mistake I see young founders making out of school. Is, in fact, my favorite story is I get this literally in, because I teach in business schools at uh, Berkeley and Columbia and engineering schools at, at Stanford and sometimes Caltech. Is the the I always get a couple of students every year. Professor Blank, I need to job choice. Great. What do you got? Well, I got I got choose between these two things. Well, what are they? Well, I got this great offer from McKinsey. McKinsey, great company. What's your other choice? Well, let me tell you about the startup, me and my room, and I stop. I go, I don't want to hear it. You've already decided. If you're considering well, McKinsey, you? you're not an entrepreneur. <laughs> there you go. Right. You can't keep both of them. Well, why do you want to do this? And what you really peel the onion, it's cool. Well, mm -hmm. yeah, it might be cool, but you know, like that's the bullshit part of entrepreneurship. Mm -hmm. The reason why artists and founders need to be passionate is it sucks 95% of the time. <laughs> yeah. You're failing, your co-founders are quitting, or they're, you know, or they're it's too stoned most of the time to show up for work, or, you know, what, or like you can't attract money, or your, your board is beating the crap out of I mean, that's what it's all. Our customers are, forget about customers, we don't have any. I mean, that's 95% of the time. If you're not driven through those bad times by passion and, and, and drive and the, the, just the desire to make something happen, it, you're going to just quit it the first time it gets it gets bad. Yeah, and, and that's and, and you can't teach that, but you can teach entrepreneurship to those who volunteer. Mm. That's the answer to your question. Yeah, good and, answer. And it, does that make no, sense? No, that, that makes perfect and, sense. And we never got that right because we were confusing where we taught it in business schools or engineering schools versus how we should teach it. Mm -hmm. And how we should teach it is just go look at our curriculum. It's okay. We teach survey classes for arts for everybody. We should teach survey classes for entrepreneurship. We teach theory for art, like you know, mixing color and three D perspective. We should teach theory for you know, patent law and other stuff. But the rest of the art curriculum is hands on and experiential. Yeah. And that's what we've been missing is how to write a business plan and do a effing PowerPoint deck. It's not experiential. <laughs> Get out of the building. And in my class, you have to talk to a hundred customers in 10 weeks yeah. let me tell you that's experiential absolutely and, and while you might hate me by the time you're done you will know how to actually mix paint and, and mm -hmm. you know and like figure out how to do art yeah does well, that answer your question no, that's great well steve this has been an incredible interview i have one last question yeah. it's the high level fortune cookie question you can yeah. answer it any way you want but what's the best advice you have for anyone that's currently in a startup and they're trying to grow it what would you say to them? Obviously, you don't know the details of their situation, but uh, just ne never, never give up. Um, you know, entrepreneurship is is the pursuit when everybody else thinks you're crazy. Um, and by the way, you have to be, mm -hmm. and um, you have to decide that this is the thing you want to do with your life. Um, anytime it feels like a job, you know, no one's forcing you to do this other than you, and. and I actually, to be honest, try to discourage people from becoming entrepreneurs um, because the ones who will make it are the ones who see things out there that other people don't, but they could convince you 
who, who can barely, what do you mean? No, 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 look over, look over there, come with me and get rational people to quit their jobs and, you know, whatever, to go do that. If that's who you are, then for God's sake, just stick to it. And if it's not this one, it'll be the next one. This was my entire career, and I've never once thought I would have done, wanted to do some other job. It's the most exciting time in the world to be an entrepreneur, and um, just congratulations to all your viewers who are doing it, and thanks for the time. Well, that's awesome. Steve, thank you okay. so much for coming on Growth Hacker TV. All right. Take care. Bye-bye.